recording. Hello, my name is Colin Goldberg and uh, welcome to the Techspressionist Salon number 35. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all here. I'm standing in for um, Davo as moderator today. And uh, we have three or actually four artists in total uh, presenting. Um, Lily Kastreva, who's going to be the, the first artist. And then we have um, a pair of collaborating artists, Prince Magnolia and St. Rivera. And then rounding out our um, salon today is Michael uh, Pierre Price. So we're going to get started um, and jump right into things um, with Lily. So Lily, if you want to just introduce mm -hmm. yourself and, um, you know, um, you feel free to share your screen and, and jump right in. And uh, after each artist, uh, what we'll do is do a quick um, Q&A session um, and then move on to the next artist. And if there's time remaining after the artist presentations, we'll kind of open it up for discussion. And uh, everyone that's on now is welcome to stick around after the recording stops. And that's when we sort of have our um, after party slash advisory board meeting. We'll have to come up with a better, a better name for that. But basically when we discuss community building stuff, um, that'll happen right after the recording ends at four. So um, welcome, Lily. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Okay, see possible I can change back. Okay, my name is Lily Kastriva. Um, I came from Taiwan. So today, basically, I want to share is about my art journey with everybody. I think everybody here is artist, and uh, almost all your life is artist, just like me. So basically, it's just a humble story how I learned and how I grown up and how I became an artist. So here you can see uh, I have a picture from Paul Saizan. And, and probably this is how I started the artist. And here I have a quoting from the Frank Gehry called, making art is making love to the world. Um, I'm not only an artist, I'm also a critique. So I write, once I wrote an article about Frank Gehry and it was an interview and uh, I find out this is such a beautiful quoting and I find out it's uh, applied for myself. And here you can see uh, my website here. Hmm. So hold on just Okay, anyhow, here, the link will go into my website and my website will have uh, my writing about as a critique and uh, all, the, all the magazine I was writing for about. So, Mm -hmm. hmm. I hope I'm still there. <laughs> okay. Uh, how am I going to go back? Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry about this. That's okay. Okay, great. Okay, the um the reason I want to talk about the Paul Sai Sang's painting is because uh I growing up just like everybody, I drawing every day, I do um, I take all your pastel and the mixed color things I was ever remember. I was always drawing, drawing, drawing. But I didn't know something called artists. I never heard about this thing. So when I was nine years old, it's the first time I ever see, okay, go back. I don't know. Um, ah. Okay, great. So, when I was nine years old, I first time I ever see the my father has a magazine, and I growing up in a small town, really small town of Taiwan. My father has a magazine has this uh, Paul Sai Sang's cover, um, Monks and Victoria. So I was really surprised how beautiful, how gorgeous the color can be. I was so excited. I started 
use watercolor, started doing all this painting and drawing about Sai Sang's painting and uh, kind of gradually copy one by one. And then I heard that Sai Sang is the artist. So I heard people can be an artist. I, so I asked my sister, I say, so can I be an artist? She said, okay, um, if you wanna be an artist, you need to go to art school. So that time, during that time, uh, one of the best art school in my country is called National Taiwan Normal University Art College. So I set up my goal to go to the college. So, the, so start at age 12, my sister find out her teacher is a Chinese art master. She said, why don't you come in to learn some Chinese art from my teacher? So I started learning the traditional Chinese art. Um, so through those six years before I go to college, I was master with Chinese art, really good. I already have a permanent collection in one of the uh, top museum in Taiwan. So I was able to win a many, many uh, big award. So I, I realized that like, you, you can actually learn the technique really early age, in very young age, you can learn them. So eventually after six years, I actually went to the college. But in Taiwan college, it's not like in America, everybody can go into college. For us, it's like a 4,000 talent gift our student. They only pick us 30. So basically it's less than 1% chance you can gain our college. So by then I finally, I gained a college. I start learning from more master artists, learning this kind of traditional ski. You can see here during my college years, I was doing the Chinese painting and then tra traditional style. So it's a lot of mountain landscaping. I do a lot of flower birds and, and I'm able to actually master really well about all the traditional style. But I started asking myself a major question. Why I want to be an artist, I was inspired by Sai Sang's painting because the freedom, the color, but not because I like to manipulate the, the technique or learning the technique so well, not, not because I just want to copy somebody or follow the tradition. So I feel like that is not my calling to do. So during that time, it was very confused time for me. So then after graduate, I became a high school art teacher. I start thinking about if one day possible, I want to go to America to learn something like a contemporary art, something I, how to be a, just be an artist. You can fully express yourself and you can express yourself in any kind of situation, almost like an art can be like a making a movie. It's in 2D situation, you're making a movie and you can express your feeling. So, so, so then I come into college, I, because I was not able to speak English. So I come into college in America, I find out, allow me to survive. I had to learn something called computer or computer graphics. So instead of doing a painting, I choose to do design computer graphics. And that was a, a blessing because this allowed me to survive in America for, for another three decades because the, your computer, you always find a job. In the uh, computer art, in computer, in IT field, you will never like have a job. So, but during my study in the computer graphics, I took one class called history of contemporary art. I started learning the postmodern. I learned all these uh, contemporary artists. Then my, my, my teacher started encouraging me. So why don't you just try use a bamboo brush and a rice paper to do something about contemporary art. So this is my first attempt. You can see here, I start doing all these uh, uh, painting, still painting in traditional Chinese rice paper. I still use the Chinese ink, but I am able to freely express my feeling. And the left corner, you will see this banana princess. I still have a, a lot of traditional skill, but I'm able to handle this Disney princess with this Chinese, combined with Chinese style, almost like a pop art style. Then on the right hand side, I can actually talk about my own feeling as a, a girl, a girl growing up. So the painting is called Growing Pain. It's like the girl growing up, how you look at the shadow, you're growing up, but then you kind of wonder about yourself, you have a lot of issues you have to deal with. 
And so I was able to use the traditional skill plus the contemporary thought to kind of create my art. And that one actually win a, win a really good big award during that time. So then after I graduated from getting my master's degree, I soon get a really good job uh, in Dallas working as a computer artist, graphic designer. And uh, during, and then I soon get a good job in Chicago as a uh, uh, art director. So during that, also I accept the offer to be an artist in residence in Queens, Austria. Queens, Austria is a place have a, more than 1000 years old history. So going there, so basically I'm going there doing the oil painting and doing this traditional oil painting landscape I was really good about. So I do the show in Queens, Austria. During that time, I went to a lot of Runer and Queso. And the Runer, I saw a five goats dancing around right next to me. I was so attracted by those goats. I feel like it's something I was connected with the animal. I feel like that's something I want to express. Something about animal freely express, dancing around. They can be any kind of color. They can have a freedom to talk about their own story. So coming back, I start doing the painting like the, this type of painting you see here. So during that time, um, my original school, I was uh, graduate with a MA degree, invited me coming back to be a full-time teacher. So teaching the graphic design, teaching the computer art. So during that time, I was able to get a free tuition to get a MFA degree in painting. Um, you know, that was my first goal coming to United States to get a painting degree but I was not able to do it in the, in the beginning because I don't have the money also. I don't think that painting, I can get any job as a painter. So during my MFA study, my teacher is, um, my advisor is from the Palestinian, is um, actually growing up in Detroit. Um, he's a Palestinian Christian artist, very interesting, um, he, he just, he treated me so nice. It's like, a, I have a really good teacher. So I told my teacher, like, I really don't know what should I do because I was coming from the Chinese painting background. I really don't know too much about Western art. So I really don't know where to study with the MFA. So he suggested me to study because he was really into the August uh, McGee is a German expressionist. Uh, so he said, why don't you start with uh, old Gogus Maki? So I do a lot of study research art history, uh, study the German expressionist. So during that time, I found a Franz Mark. Franz Mark died in World War I, but then he did a lot of painting about animal and how the animal can express humans suffering through the war. So, on the right hand side, you can see I started doing those rendering drawing during my MFA study. I started to feel like I can actually do the drawing combine my Chinese brush ink and it was this uh, German expressionist and with uh, this Frank Marx kind of art, became kind of like an animal and the landscaping. And also during that time, uh, I took an art criticism class. And I saw art criticism, you can never make a anything with uh, art criticism, but I fell in love with art criticism. Uh, my, my teacher, Dr. Smoke, was really um, um, teaching me a lot of stuff about art criticism. And I, that, that really gave me the chance to really writing about Franz Mark. I started writing about Franz Mark. I used him as a, a model for me to start art criticism writing about his art. And uh, eventually later on in my life, I met another guy called um, uh, Derek Gruz. Uh, Derek, he was the founder of a uh, New Examiner magazine, and he needed somebody to help him to revive the magazine and uh, push the magazine and be can cover the Europe. And I became a, 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 a person to able to through many years to help the magazine actually 
expanding the border from, from America to the Europe and allow me to learn, not only to learn art criticism, also learning how to write as art critique. So that was uh, serendipity. It was some, nothing I, I never thought about it would happen in my life. As a foreigner coming to America, never know any English, doesn't even know how to write, uh, listen or speak, able to actually tap in, be a writer to write an art critique. So next thing I want to introduce. So unfortunately, during my MFA study, my uh, beloved teacher died in a brain cancer. It was a shock because, uh, it, we, we, you know, he's such, we, he's such a wonderful teacher to me. Um, one day he said, oh, I had to go to a hospital, get some exam. Then he never come back. He just died in a brain cancer. So I have a, a wish. It's like I have a somewhere I can memory about about him. And, uh, and my style actually turned into become a really spiritual. And I want one day I can able to go back to uh uh, to Jordan or, 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 or go to the place he came from and able to meet with all the Palestinian artists. So eventually 2012, I was able to go back to uh, Palestinian to meet with all the artists, to visit all the artists and uh, able to really learn about their art. So, so through the my, because the transition, my advisor passed away. So I, my painting, Switch it to me, became the, uh, uh, the whole series in my graduation, became the, all about spiritual, about the, how to touch by angels is my, my, my thing. And uh, eventually in the future also continue, I became the, to in many involved, many painting involved in the spiritual ring. So then after I graduated from my MFA degree, I became the, uh, a professor. You know, a person never know how to speak English, never know how to, it was a, it was a really surprise because during that time I graduated, I have a computer degree and I have uh, my painting and my degree. And I was able to get a many, many interview from many universities because they needed somebody to able to teach computer art. So I was tapped into become a professor and uh, on the job in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And I always wanted to be nearby New York City, so I'm able to see museums. Um, but however, that the, the professorship was not last a long time because my parents really want me to get married. They feel like I was 30 some years old, I need to get married to have a children. So eventually I am out to quit my job to become a stay home mother uh, to raise three children. So during the motherhood, uh, I was, for seven years, I basically just changed the diaper for straight seven years. And then one day I just feel like uh, my, my inner self is calling me, I need to go back to art. So I rent a small studio. I start doing painting, but I didn't know how to do it. So I said, okay, maybe I'm start doing the painting on canvas, but then connect, I connect all my learning in the uh, Chinese art. So I start doing this uh, mixed medium, uh, all your painting, uh, and I paved the rice paper on the canvas and writing the Chinese choreography and do some abstract pop art. It's kind of basic, it's like all my contemporary art history learning. I kind of merged them to my canvas. So that was the start uh, when I was a, a mother trying to figure out. And uh, so, uh, uh, very fortunately, I Receive many invitation. I started showing my art in many different countries during that time. So, um, so let me just okay, see possible. Okay. Um, okay. So okay. So this is a uh, my okay. I hope. We can see this better. <clears throat> okay, this is my race series, Oriental Ray. Uh, during that time, um, I tried to explain to my American friends what is more, uh, what's mean red color, 
in Chinese culture as a red color. Uh, I came from Taiwan and Taiwan uh, is um, everything is rooted in Chinese culture. So we celebrate the Chinese New Year. So we have everything is a red envelope, everything's red color and red uh, symbolize the fortune, lucky and uh, all the, um, <laughs> it's just, a, it's a lot of things about red. So, but in the Western culture, red is like a murder, it's like, a, it's not really as such a, like a lucky place and kind of color. So I try to have a, some kind of dialogue with my American friends, explain to them why we use red color. Red color is to symbolize everything good in Chinese culture. In the new year, we should have a red color. So because of this reason, I was invited to in the headquarter of a Peel, Michigan to have this show called Oriental Red to allow uh, people in Michigan to understand what is in red color. And also, when I produced this uh, race series, I was able to win the uh, uh, international award in Paris, uh, in Paris, the Salon, win the, the, uh, the only woman, Asian woman ever just came to the award, get this big, big Salon attention to this, uh, this whole series. So basically in this series, I just have a bigger, like this is a 56 inch wide canvas. I do a lot of uh, 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 texture with a uh, kind of Chinese gray color. But I also bring a lot of sand, color sand. So all the here you see a lot of pink color, yellow color. Here a lot of yellow color, gold color. Those are sand, basically just colored sand. So I started playing with a uh, color sand in my as material to my canvas. And they're still using the Chinese ink as a primary uh, inference. And I try to bring this cross-cultural kind of art to marry to this modern, modern kind of like a contemporary art. So um, during that time, also I start notice about climate change because I heard from CNN like uh, about China has this uh, smart problem people had to cover themselves with a, a mask after mask, just like today in the COVID time, we have uh, this uh, N95, but during that time, everybody had to wear masks because they can hardly breathe in because the, in, the, the air pollution was so bad. So I, I was really touching up and very sad about the whole story. So I started doing this climate change or I used the same, um, I still use the red color uh, as the sky and talking about the pollution. And I use a lot of uh, color sand to produce this kind of um, the smoke, almost like a, you can see the air pollution with a urban environment. You see a lot of big structural, uh, just like uh, we saw in, uh, in the picture of China, in Beijing, in Shanghai, they have a really a lot of urban environment, but the clouds is dark and the people has to breathe in these toxic the, the air. So uh, because this whole series of climate change is more like a social, about social justice, about the uh, environment issue. So I was able to invite uh, in many city hall and uh, Grand Rapids uh, in Michigan, the government center to show all this art, to tell people and uh, kind of educational to the kids involved in this whole series about how the environmental art will affect our life, how we able to continue to use art to talking about environment. So, okay. Um, so that was a continue as the red color as the background. And my, my, my artwork is talking about my life. My life is not like, um, uh, about the, it's basically basic as a diary about my life and a recording about how I feel about life. So through the process, I was have a major surgery and, and I was not able to work for, for a long time. I basically had to train myself how to become a, like a normal person to walk again. So that was a major shock. And it's kind of like a huge transition, allow me to understand life is such, life is such like a show, um, 
for artists, if you are able to recording everything in your life, maybe that's it. So I'm trying to say goodbye to my red color. I try to think about if whatever or any social topics, I look inwards in myself, say if I want to talk about anything, maybe I want to use animal, just like a friend's mark, just like a, a lot of Chinese artists during the um, Ming Dynasty, Song Dynasty, when the dynasty changed, the country change them to another different dynasty. A lot of people that use the animal use birds to talking about the emotion. So I would try to use that way. I said, maybe I need to go back to animal painting to talk about my life, to talk about how I come as an artist. I wanted to continue a dream, dream along dream path is my um, my next, next series talking about art. So, so this ray series is that during the surgery, I saw from I saw from my window, I see all the sunset. Uh, I can see the pine tree on my backyard, the pine tree with the sunset as background or the red color. So I transitioned them to, to kind of different symbolize about from the real tree to just eventually become a, or just geometric. And this is a, probably the end of my red period. The race as so next one is my my dream or uh, dream along dream path. Here is the animal road trip. So I use the animal. I I want this animal is a dream like animal. So it's basically it's a could be a deer, could be a horse, could be a, a symbolize of a human. So this animal doesn't need to have to be a, a real animal shape, but can be a, some kind of like a, just a symbol. It's a symbol about a, a creature, a creature talking about the life. So during this series, I also use a lot of Chinese character and um, an ancient character. I try to create this dream-like kind of life, the ancient character. And also I continue to use the same, uh, a white same, different color thing in my canvas. On the right hand side, you can see in the Michigan has a lot of snow, just like uh, you see maybe in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, uh, anywhere in East Coast. So on the right hand side, basically is whatever I saw from my window, the snow, a lot of snow. So I painting the snow with this animal. So here you can see on the left side, I have uh, the, um, the same art with the four season winter, win uh, the winter, spring, summer, uh, fall, about all different color, the thing out, the animal. On the right hand side, I started doing that because during the spring, you see a lot of flower, pink flower blossom everywhere, cherry blossom everywhere. So I feel like a, I want to have a tribute to Franz Mark and the, the Blue Rider, the Blue Horse. So I start doing the whole series called uh, uh, Pink Blossom and the Blue Horse. So basically, it's a, a lot of Blue Rider, Blue Horse on the background. So I was able to get invited to Hamburg, uh, Hamburg, Germany to do this show to show my tribute. So I feel like I was really lucky in my life. Um, art is a part of my life. and. The, able to talking about art uh, and able to send a tribute to many, many artists. I really uh, enjoy their art and uh, they, they, they influence my life. No matter going to uh, Jordan or going to Germany, I feel like that's the, a combination about my journey of life. Also the art journey I'm going through. So next one is, um, so from there I start a, uh, kind of wonder about what my next going to do with uh, my my animal painting, and I really uh, also because a lot of show I was doing uh, in a foreign country, I find out like uh, the same art was not I had to uh, 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 took the canvas out rolling in the roll. I find that a lot of thing I was not able to transport um, during this traveling. So I decided to say maybe I need to go back to uh, watercolor or canvas, not going to have a thing as a material. 
So during that time, my girlfriend said, here, I have, I'm gonna do a piano concert. She's a professor uh, in uh, teaching the piano. He said, I'm, I want to invite you to do a, a PowerPoint, kind of like a, a film. So while I'm playing the piano with a, a Chinese music, I'm able to put your uh, painting according to my music. So that time we, we have a one song called Her Boy's Song. And so we are able to do the process. I kind of just kind of share really quick about. Um, so basically I did the, the A piece of watercolor and I'm able to play with uh, these. Uh, so you can see this is a, a, a Chinese composer, the Chinese music playing piano. Then I'm able to, according to the piano, to design the, the shepherd boys, try to shepherd all these uh, sheep. Uh, I'm not seeing it, um, it playing on my end. I don't know if anyone else is. I'm seeing the YouTube logo, but just the black yeah. screen. Um, but maybe um, if you could paste a link um, to okay. it into the chat. Okay. Uh, uh. Let me see passport. Can you go back? Okay, here. Oh, I have, okay. Um, okay, I need to share again for some reason. Okay, here, let's go. So on the right hand side, you can see here, uh, I started doing this uh, from the, because from this, uh, this combination with the uh, music and the watercolor, I come out the inspiration doing uh, a, lot of, a lot of different, uh, my new painting about the, the animal as a group. And it was really cute. Uh, a lot of cute animal, a lot of different color combination. So it's on the right hand side, you can see here. Okay. Then from there, uh, during the 2017 and 2018, I lost my parents. 2017, my father passed away and 2018, my mother passed away. It really affected me. As an artist, you are very sensitive about your environment and your feeling. So I feel like uh, I was uh, a lost sheep. So I started, um, because if you, you, you know about the Bible has a story about a hundred sheep, a lost sheep. So I feel like uh, I, that, was, uh, that was me. I'm the one wandering around. And uh, I was, I don't know how to deal with my, uh, past my parents, it was such, and such a strong impact in my life. So I started doing all these painting on the left hand side and a lot of drawing and a, a lot of confuse. Then you can see the outline, the ship as, a, as me. I'm searching for something. And then gradually I come out of the situation. So I paint the, on the gradually became the, the right hand side. If you go to my website, you can see all the process from this painting became that painting. And then eventually I finished this uh, right hand side, this painting was able to, um, the Yale University uh, was very touched by my whole 
story so they saw my right hand painting uh, posting their uh, uh, medical school uh, publication. They used a two page introduce my hardship and uh, I think it's a healing, it's a healing process. So I, I can understand why they choose this piece of painting. They feel like it's an inspiration and they want to use my art to become a healing power for people to go through my, my whole, the same kind of situation. So then continue. And after my parents pass away, I, I just decided I want to go to Cuba and Iceland. And going to Cuba is because I, I always loved the, the omen and see the story. I feel like going to Cuba, I can uh, face the, the ocean and really to understand Ernest Hemingway, how, how he write the story. So maybe I can get inspiration to continue going as an artist. So coming back from Cuba, I created the, the, the old ship. It's like a, a Cuban style with a lot of color, the ocean. And I also, a year later, my, my, my mother passed away. I went to Iceland because the, you know, mother, how mother is important to any kids. So my mother passed away. It was such, such emotional impact in my life. And I feel like I need to go into Iceland to find a northern light to really feel how lonely, how, to feel like I need to go to see, just to see, uh, uh, um, you know, Iceland, the rock, the volcano, the isolation, the destitution or some kind of, I, I feel like I need that kind of feeling to feel like I'm so close to the, so close to something, um, really understand myself so so produce coming back i produced the whole series uh, iceland so continue um the iceland series and and i feel like uh, after so many decades after iceland i i really feel like uh, if life is so short if anything I want to pursue, I maybe need to do it. I don't need to wait for too late. So by then, it's like a, uh, I have to spend 20 years to raise my three children. They are all growing up. So I feel like maybe I need to go to New York City. So I started applying for a job to New York City. You know, by then I was, um, uh, okay, I'm going to the New York City. So, so, so by the time I think about going to New York City, I already I'm already past the 55 years old. I'm an old lady. I just think that nobody will offer me a job in New York City. But however, because I have a computer degree, so as an IT person, I was very lucky. Fortunately, as I said before, you have a, a computer art degree, you always find a job. So I was able to get the job in New York City right away after thinking about going to New York City. So I was able to survive uh, to pay the really, you know, how expensive the rent, living in Manhattan, everything. Now, two weeks after I moved to New York City, uh, COVID happened, the whole New York City lockdown. New York City lockdown is like a basic, everybody is locked inside your tiny, tiny apartment. And you will have to work from home. The thing is that uh, the people die around you every day. So basically 24 hours, the ambulance sirens was 24 hours surrounding me. I was living in a fear, I was not able to go out even do grocery. I remember I stayed inside my house for 45 days without going outside. So only time I ever go outside is when to get a grocery and I have to kind of spray myself with a, with all the grocery. It was like, everybody remember those days on the, uh, 2020 in the March, how scary. And in New York City was like, a, people ba basically died and they don't even have a, a funeral home to bury people. So all the body was locked in the, a trunk, the huge, huge truck in Brooklyn under the bridge. So every day, only thing I, I face is the horrible news, horrible news day by day. So my my hundred ship no longer have that smiling, not cute smiling. It became almost like torturing. 
torturing figure, all these animals be kind of, all these um, northern line Iceland be kind of this torture animal. So, so my, my, my inside was full of tear and uh, all my painting is talking about death, about people dying. And uh, before we have a vaccination, I just don't see any hope. I don't see that we can ever come out of the tunnel. So I continue doing this painting for until finally 2021. Since I started doing change, like uh, New York City, no longer locked down people, they started inviting people, everybody coming back to New York City. So 2021 to 2022, I was able to go to Brooklyn Botanic Garden again and again, and during the springtime, I was able to see all the beautiful cherry blossom. And during that time, my very good friends in New York City is, um, is uh, we call father of a uh, future, future, after future reason, uh, uh, Al Miller, that I'll just one day just call me, he said, Lily, I feel like, I feel like you should go back to your roots, your Chinese uh, roots. I feel like somewhere there, you, you go so far away, but have you think about going back, you roots thinking about how you able to produce something from the beginning as a Chinese artist. So, and, the, and because also during the 2021, I moved to even smaller one bedroom apartment. I no longer have a, a big living room as my studio. I don't even have a space, so I only have a tiny table. And I, I think this is a perfect suggestion because it was a, a small, tiny space. And I was able to produce a lot of Chinese painting because Chinese painting you only need a brush. You don't, you need a small table. You don't need to have a big space. So through the process, I started to think about how can I, from the beginning, I was not able to want to do the Chinese painting because the tradition, I wanted to break through the tradition. But right now, go through all these uh, three decades, four decades, I can rethink about something different. I can actually use my uh, uh, drawing skill, my bamboo brush to talk about life. I can talk about life in different way. So I started painting all these shapes that can, they can be a, a life that can be a can be a, any kind of human uh, human figure the expression they can be talking about the people living in a, a subdivision have a nice green pasture people have a nice life we can also talk about people on the other hand was suffering from lacking of everything because in New York City you see homeless people you see everything basically you see the extreme people are so wealthy and people are so poor. So, so through the whole process, I was able to just use uh, uh, my training to talk about this uh, ship painting. So I call it this 100 ship process, the 100 ship painting. And, and you can see from my website, the kind of new beginning, uh, how I actually start marry the, the, my ink painting, my Chinese traditional ink painting to the contemporary painting, start married to the style. Uh, I'm still in the process, try learning how can I remerge really those two styles became of my own style. And thank you, give me this chance to share my, uh, my journey with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. Thanks for sharing your work with us. Um, really interesting to see and to see how it relates to um, to expressionism and, and uh, the, the Blau Rider and everything else like that. It's interesting to see um, that connection, you know, because so much of the conversation has been predominantly about technology, but not as much about expressionism. So it's it's nice and refreshing to see that. Um, so I guess um, really quickly, does anyone have any any questions? We can take maybe one or two. I just want to make sure there's enough time for the other artists to present. Anybody? I don't have a question, but I wanted to say I sure applaud your journey. I wrote in the comments that 
having traveled from Georgia to New York City, that was one of the biggest leaps I ever made in my little VW, uh, well, it wasn't a bus, it was a VW Beetle. And, and imagine coming, and I know there are quite a few international artists here, but hats off to those of you who've done that and, and gone to another country and looks like you've gone all around the world. And <laughs> I just really appreciated your story and how uh, you were so earnest and emotional and open about what was going on in your life while connecting it to historical uh, movements as Colin pointed out. So, so, so thank you. I, right. I second, I'm well, sorry. I said I was just wanted to second what Roz just said. It was just an amazing journey, an amazing look inside an artistic journey, as well as a life journey. So well done, Lily. Well done. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess um, we can move on to ST and um, Prince Magnolia. if you guys both want to go on together or whatever you want to do yeah we'll just kind of double team it how's it going guys i am prince magnolia this is my collaborator this st rivera uh, we've been working in the nft space recently uh doing three different performances slash collaborations uh over the course of three dubs events uh or spaces in which we held the room for 12 hours, created uh, digital art live, um, as well as physical art on one occasion, uh, and poetry. Um, on the last one, which is one that I believe she's got pulled up, versions of the same song. Uh, it was inspired basically by some of the conversations about the blockchain, metaverse, um, the future this digital physical merge uh, and what that would so before the or the week of the performance that wednesday i was at a coffee shop the poem appeared to me i then read the poem in the room uh and we pinned it to the top of the, the room so the people coming in throughout that time could read it and if they were inspired they could find a photo uh, either that they make, made, uh, found, whatever, uh, that was inspired or that caught the vibe that they got from the, the poem itself. They would send it to me and then I would take it, uh, rework it doing a digital art technique using Instagram filters that I developed. Um, it's playing with the facial recognition technology and the algorithms. Uh, it's I think your, it your audio great. cut out. Um briefly so that this was all happening within a clubhouse room right correct or, sorry okay gotcha uh, yeah i don't know if it was you or me but your your audio cut out just in the beginning of your explanation so i know that the process is definitely important um as far as how the, the piece was yeah. created we can come back around to it i think i'll let st kind of pick up for a second she might want to pick up on kind of how we met a bit yeah, hi. Is my audio okay? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, hi, I'm ST Rivera. I'm traditionally an illustrator. Um, and I met Prince Magnolia uh, on Clubhouse, which is a voice uh, voice application um, that um, it's kind of like Zoom, just without the, the, the video component. And so I uh, was running these small artist hangout rooms, and uh, Prince and I met in that room, and we aligned uh, a, a lot of the same uh, ideas regarding like the blockchain and NFTs and the kind of art that was uh, getting really popular at that time. Um, that was in August that we met and about the beginning of the summer or late spring was the launch of collectibles like the Bored Apes. Um, and there were all these big rooms where people were uh, what they call shilling, which is not as lovely as a showcase, but it's more like um, 
selling your, your work. And so it was really exhausting. And these artists hang rooms were a bit of a reprieve from that. So artists can come and hang out, share work, make art, poetry. And that's where we met. Um, and I was really intrigued by Prince's um, art technique, which he had just alluded to, um, where he uses the um, the filters and in Instagram to create new works. Um, so what is on the screen right now is the poem that Prince was just talking about. Um, Prince, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. All right. And yeah, actually, will you read it for me this time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just so you folks know, um, I'm in Washington and Prince is in Oklahoma. So we collaborated um, in this way, many states apart. <laughs> um, so this is the poem Sylvian that he wrote. Sylvian. She found herself in a forest, checkpoint undefined, digital flora, digital fauna, cascading rhythms of light. The architect was a raver in a former life. His bio read like a new age hippie, tech utopian of late capitalist design. Flitting through her archive, the data points aligned. The forest was a maze made with her in mind. In the center, rumors were a sculpture rarer than Rodin, a neo-digital primitivist, one of one, rendered post corpus, unlocked with the silence of its creator's biometrics. Kefir, a neon glow, etching patterns as she wandered below, remnants of an ancient blockchain from Web 2.0. Yeah, so the clubhouse rooms, um, the performances became spaces in which uh, different artists uh, that we had met throughout the NFT community, people in tech um, and other kind of industries, just people throughout that kind of interesting myriad of humans that kind of wander out throughout that app. Uh, kind of would bob and weave throughout the night and their stories the their takes on the art as it was being made um we were minting it live so they were able to watch it be um visibly created and then sold in many occasions um and that created its own kind of narrative that we fed off of and so each time that we did them it kind of created its own unique experience that in turn fed into developing the narrative further uh to the point where in versions th this poem where you have this character sylvian appear um and it's this projected future this kind of speculative future uh, with kind of what we have contemporarily technologically and then the ideas are kind of circling around the spaces about things like decentralization and autonomy or sorry autonomous like robotics blah 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 ubis um and so it's kind of that idea projected a thousand years into the future looking at a character that's exploring these blockchains from a pre-singularity AI universe uh, or the metaverses that were created at that time and finding the art and the NFTs as if they're like artifacts, you know, that she's like an archeologist. Uh, and so as each person was sending a different photo I was reworking it and then being inspired by the image uh, the poem would appear to me and it weave this narrative of these different perspectives and lives uh, and then a, a couple different characters also appeared 
uh, one being Mara.ai, um, which we subsequently, after this experience, she, uh, ST has continued to work on a couple different projects and we found the narrative kind of weaving into her work, but appearing with new characters that we're going to then be developing with uh, a new project where we're going to be doing a gallery takeover with a friend. So that's on the horizon, but I'll let SC kind of take over a bit and fill in where I've missed. Yeah, I'm just um, now launching the On Cyber Gallery. So you folks can take a look at uh, the gallery in the metaverse that we have here. Um, some of them are not loading because they're reading from the blockchain. So, you know, we just got to make do with, with the tech uh, as it comes. But as Prince said, uh, we did three of these collaborations. Uh, the first one was called a surprisingly fun thing I'll probably never do again. And that came from uh, a project that Prince did solo in the beginning of the summer. Um, where he made a hundred images from one source photo um, of a lamp, I believe. Um, and it broke Instagram's algorithm a bit. And it uh, basically made him, uh, they, they thought he was a bot. Um, and so it kept uh, glitching out um, and removing some things that uh, were referring to missing murdered indigenous women. And so there were issues with censorship as well. So when Prince and I met um, and you know, uh, we talked about this, uh, we thought it was a fantastic idea to circumvent posting to Instagram altogether and redo the, the project um, and minting it directly to the blockchain. So Prince took a photo of his backyard um, and then from there made 100 images in 12 hours, while on my end in, in the clubhouse room, I was minting and um, modding. We were checking in on each other, making sure we were okay, um, playing music. And I'll just quickly switch to that gallery so you can see. Here we go. So there are actually, <laughs> there are actually four of them. Um, because it's it's a hundred pieces, but so so the original image um, I don't think is here, but it's a picture of the gal of excuse me of his backyard, and so as the night progressed, um, you know poetry did end end up emerging. And uh, there are common, there's commentary on uh, the board apes, on CryptoPunks, a lot of the, the collectible projects that were um, part of the, the commentary that we, that, um, we were touching on. Um, let's switch. So here's an example of some of the poetry that came through. And what I love about Prince's work and his technique is that it's all done on an iPhone, um, an iPhone SE, I, I believe. And the way that um, I formatted them is done with an iPhone app. So it's very basic tools that are being used. Um, and we, in all together, the project was, the trilogy was done in three months, 12 hours each. Um, and so in total, there are 131 pieces of art <laughs> that have been made um, in, in this time. Uh, Prince, is there anything you wanna add to, to a surprisingly fun thing um, before I go into to Echoes? I can continue showing the gallery. Uh, yeah, a couple things, whenever I, I did, um uh, surprising i found a new filter technique that kind of dissolved the image and would like create these figures based off of like kind of like two different filters refracting off of each other and when the figures kind of appeared it was f finally like kind of answering this weird 
question I had, you know, there's a, the reference in like sci-fi and stuff, the ghost in the machine kind of thing. Um, ghost in the algorithm. Uh, because these kind of figures started to appear. Uh, and so as I was working through it, it was just kind of capturing what I would see and then sometimes chasing after things that I would think that I would see. It was a really interesting experience kind of being half here, half there. And yeah, definitely a journey. Uh, the first ultra marathon that we did. <laughs> so, yeah we can go to the next one if you want. <laughs> yeah sure um so this is the third gallery definitely more uh poetry was coming out towards the end and um i mean prince could could agree uh, i think will agree that it was a surprising that made us realize how important poetry was going to be to our collaborations. There's the piece, uh, the crypto punk piece. I love that one right there in the center. Um, yeah. So a surprising, it took 12 hours for prints to create. Minting took some time. So in total, it was 14 hours. Uh, we started at, I think, 4 p.m. Uh, central time, I can't remember right now, and then ended at 6 a.m. Pacific time. I don't know if that math is correct, but um, it, was a, it was a long night. <laughs> um, so this was in September. And then, um, you know, when we do these, we ni neither one of us ever collaborated like this before. Um, and so it took some time to actually acknowledge what it was that we worked on. Um, and and really view it, and uh, it was, I think it was Prince's idea to do another one, but instead uh, have my artwork uh, kind of lead. Where um, in a surprising and also with versions, it's more of uh, Prince's artwork. So, as I stated uh, at the beginning, I'm traditionally an illustrator, and um, when we decided to do Echoes of the Blockchain. It was a little bit of a challenge for me. My my work, um, I use ink, and it takes hundreds of hours to complete typically. And I knew that with being in this kind of marathon marathon state, and um, you know, working within twelve hours, it was really hard for me to picture what that would look like. Um, and so I have two different art styles. I have a doodleism style, which you can see in the background there, and then I have a circulism style. Um, and it wasn't until the night before the performance that I, I, I actually figured out how <laughs> I was going to uh, do my, my, my visual component of this. And so the way how it worked, um, we did six pieces. It was on Halloween and um, of last year, so October 31st, 2021. And uh, I would start the doodle on my end. And once again, in, in Clubhouse, um, I would replace my profile picture with the doodle and take that same picture and send it to Prince, who would then apply the filter technique and start one half of a poem. While he did that, I painted on top of the doodle and then um, took another photo of that, and then he and then I completed the second half of the poem. And then using an iPhone app, I merged the, the two layers and then Prince also um, animated the text that's on there. So it was a lot of back and forth. And each time the profile picture would change with an update. Um, and each piece took about two hours. So it was definitely a different um, pace than the previous collaboration. Um, and these ended up looking like tapestries. Um, and, you know, we were kind of having this conversation about what it means to be fine art on the blockchain. And, um, you know, uh, the, the actual poetry touches on humanity's relationship with technology, past, present, and future. Um, 
So I'll just scroll down a little so you can see uh, the breakdown of the process. Uh, so for the first three, um, I was using scraps. So that's a, a, a scrap of cardboard that I then glued onto a scrap of foam core. And then that is the digital component that prints manipulated. Then that's the final painting, which then led to the final piece. Um, and before I read one of the poems here, Prince, did you wanna add anything to Echoes? Yeah, um, with Echoes, we were, so the poetry kind of appeared in a surprising and in that space and that span of making those hundred images, these different motifs and ideas started to appear to me, um, which then became the world that we start to see in versions. But in Echoes, we were starting to play with these ideas and trying to find the language uh, that we could use in order to explore it. And so Echoes is that search, uh, playing with kind of older, archaic terms in some places, uh, mythology, uh, just trying to find a way to describe this kind of space and that you exist in when half of your life is in this fantasy or this theoretical reality, and you're in the other half is in this the physical um, and as that's merging and becoming more and more one or the other. So that's definitely rooted in that project. Yeah, and then there are two pieces in particular where um, we were definitely like on the same wavelength because once again, we don't go in saying this is what we're going to do. I mean, with the echoes, there was a little bit of a, a an order in which you know the, the the visual component had to be made, but you know the poetry was made there in the room as well. So I didn't know what he was going to send, and he didn't know what I was going to to finish with. Um, but there were two pieces where um, the colors that he did in in his digital piece, I had already started doing in the painting. And that one, one of them is Terrapin Cloth Magic Rug, which is currently on the screen. Um, I love this piece because it's <laughs> the colors are just so in tune with each other. Um, and then uh, the next one is, is Paris, uh, Paris 1889. Um, and I'll, I'll read that one. Paris, 1889. There is something out there, she whispered in my ear. Cold October new. Your webcam was angled just right. The forest behind the river in bloom. Over your shoulder, a myriad of color. Pixelated lust, a mirror of the season. Reflection rendering, hours on end. Fans blowing hot air to warm the room. Skin to skin analog experience, you shut the door. So, yep. And I'll just, oh, sorry, oh, go ahead, Prince, I forgot to mute. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was just saying, I that one. <laughs> thank you. She yeah. finished that one and I did. And so I never knew what she was gonna like the second half of the poem would be. And that one always felt like such a mic drop moment. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so then uh, that was like, yeah, the after Paris was then Jericho, which for me was the most difficult to, to finish the poem. Um, it was getting late. My cat was hungry. Um, it was really, it was, it was, the, the music that was playing just wasn't getting it through. So this piece, everything was ready except for the second half of the poem. Um, so that for me, that was the, this was the hardest uh, to to finish. And um, yeah, I know I know Prince has had moments too where, you know, because it's it's live and and it's it's performance. You know, you you have to 
you have to keep going. <laughs> you know, you have to find a way to uh, muster the energy or find the words to complete it. Um, so any uh, last comments, Prince, before we connect the two to versions? Well, I just want to say if people do get the time to see it in the metaverse, is it in, it's not in CryptoVox. No, anymore, right? so this, this the, uh, yeah, it's not in CryptoVox. So Echoes in the Blockchain was selected to be on display for a week in um, CryptoVoxels, as well as the Central Land in, um, in the museum district right by Sotheby's. So that was, I think, I think that was last month. We ended the, the year with uh, this piece, with this uh, collection in the metaverse, but it is on cyber. Um, and as Prince said earlier, uh, there have been subsequent works that have come from this trilogy that will be, you know, uh, I guess, added to the, the overall narrative. Um, oh yeah, I did take pictures. Okay, so here are pictures of the, of the gallery from when it was in, thank you, Pass ST, <laughs> from when uh, it was hanging in crypto voxels. So I forgot that I did that. Uh, I was going to say, once we do get it back up somewhere, like the, her, cause she did the painting below and the speed at which we were moving, like she was taking the photographs of them and sometimes the paint would still be drying or, you know, there, there would still be like a flower or a leaf or something in it. It was wait. really cool to see them in that space and be able to see that detail. Yeah, and the one that's on the screen, Lilith, you can see. So yeah, with, with my paintings, I'm not a painter. Um, it was very experimental. I was using a sponge, flowers, and my hands. So in this piece, you can still see flower, that, uh, like a couple of petals that were stuck into the paint. Um, in, in Terrapin, uh, you could still see that the paint was very wet because um, it was very just in the moment. Uh, yeah. So... So after this, which was in October, um, Prince uh, came up with the concept for versions. And uh, Prince, do you want to talk about the connection between echoes and versions? And we, talk, we already talked about Sylvian, but maybe you want to go into it a little bit more? Yeah, so uh, by the time of echoes, I had found language, and that's whenever I did Sylvian. And that's when the, this kind of the full concept kind of appeared of this speculative future. And so you subsequently get the journey of with each poem and each NFT of uh, this character kind of going through these different stories, but the stories are inspired by the images that I was getting that night. And it was from people within the community, some and some complete strangers that wandered in um, different ages, different continents, some in Europe, some uh, in the States, some in South America, some in India. Uh, and like their <laughs> inspiration from the poem would then give me that source photo. And sometimes they were willing because of being moved by the poetry or by the moment. Um, to share things that were very personal. Uh, one of them is called Pastoral, and it's an image of uh, a gentleman named Kevin Pasco, I believe is his last name, right, ST? Yes, Kevin Pasco. It's on yeah. the screen uh, now. He's a really nice gentleman in the space uh, that does a lot for the community, but he shared a photo of his great grandmother, I believe, in Oklahoma. in um during the dust bowl and i happen to be in Tahlequah, oklahoma currently whenever we were working on it and the conversation once again uh as paris was kind of named after the year of the world's fair in 18 paris 1889 i was also thinking of what this kind of speculative future will look like for a uh a rural community you know when when we merge more into cities or into space and so on um as technology both proliferates and increases in 
uh, rapidly expands, it also is not evenly dispersed, as is said a lot of times. Um, and so him sending that, I was able to touch on, on that and write pastoral, which I want to read, actually, personally. So one second, sorry. So I didn't realize I was going to do that. Ghost towns, post industrial scars, empire and denial, degradation, poverty and blight, a hundred years before and after. Cycles, past made present. Ancestors spoke of a people that once spoke to the ghosts in the machine till the machine started to breathe with the voices of their dreams. That was a very emotional um, night. These rooms create an intimacy um, and it allows us to be vulnerable and then in turn the people in the room to be vulnerable as well. Um, and I, I was very emotional that night. <laughs> um, and just to get on a, a personal, my sister actually was able to come to this performance and participate and, and submit an image that I had taken of her, you know, I think it was seven years ago or eight years ago. Um, so to, you know, uh, hear Kevin's reaction to how Prince treated his image and the poem that was written, um, it was just a, a beautiful moment. Um, so, yeah. And this is actually the one uh, of my sister <laughs> that she submitted. Yeah, if you want to read that one to close it out. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. yeah, so just to give a little context, and we'll open to questions or whatever. But um, So that one, her sister sent it to me surprisingly in the back channel because she, I think, as T you can say, like they've not been the closest in the past few years, especially with COVID happening. And so her kind of showing up to support uh, an artistic endeavor that she was doing, especially in a new space like Clubhouse was a huge thing for her. Um, and so then whenever I got the image, uh, she gave me a little bit of the backstory that made me want to express a certain perspective I don't see um and i want to definitely elaborate on in the future uh which is that of the uh her anti-hero feminine heroic character i guess <laughs> like you know <laughs> enough of like the excuses or the 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 uh i don't know just a, a real perspective in a, in a female kind of cyberpunk element but that's kind of the moment that uh i was given because of the vibe that she she was putting out in the image uh i was just getting this urban sprawl uh, and the strength of of her in that moment and then that image uh was a cool thing to riff off of so here's zeta graffiti in the sprawl transfixed on its writhing incantation. She traced each line as if it led to the emptiness inside, chasing images of your life, mirror entered, monochrome, black and white, and yet more alive. The bone handle of the Sicario's knife looked worn and old. He asked if I was shy, I defied. He, sm he spelled death with his last breath. The sprawl never sleeps. It writhes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us.
Yeah, thank you. We feel privileged to be here and to share our art with you. Thank you so much, um, ST and Prince. Um, really great to uh, to see this presentation. And um, I definitely felt a, a connection in terms of, I felt like I was entering into William Gibson's reality of, you know, Neuromancer and that whole future era. But, uh, you know, in real time, in today's time, it's like we're slipping into that, that place where the sprawl is a real thing. So it's interesting. Um, and it was cool, Prince, to connect with you over Instagram in that chat um, the other day. I felt like I got to, to know you a little bit um, going back and forth about music. So nice to, um, you know, see the work. And are there any questions from the, the, the rest of the folks here? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, I can envision uh, this, the, this project rolling out as prints and also as a book. Have you all considered um, developing prints from the individual components or, or creating a book? Or are you in, intending to just keep the presentation within the cyber realm? So uh, for disclosure, like I've last year uh, I had basically all my personal possessions stolen, um, which led to me um, during a move, which led to me using the Instagram technique and iPhone because I didn't have any of my previous work <coughs> or material. And so anyways, I've been trying to get back up on my feet since then. Uh, and so we've been kind of working with what we have had, but we're definitely developing things both in the metaverse as well as IRL, uh, physical, um, ways to express it in different mediums and formats, 100%. Uh, we both kind of, one of the big things that we connected on was the realization that a 21st century artist is a multi-hyphenate, uh, like basically you have to be and so kind of looking at things as different mediums of expression whether it's a t-shirt to a graphic novel or an nft uh, or a canvas it's all equal in our eyes um, and it's not necessarily something that's about capitalism or <laughs> a comment pro or against that it's more of uh, different ways to have a conversation and tell our story to people and ways that people like to be told stories too. Have you, have you considered uh, setting up a Patreon account to help raise funds that would facilitate you uh, being able to get back on your feet, do what you want to do? That's a very good idea. Uh, we haven't, we've been just kind of hustling doing what we've been doing, but that's a very good idea. Thank you. Welcome. So I I put oh sorry just to say I put in the chat a question. Do you have a direct link to this so we can see it online? Yes. So there are direct links to the web pages. The crypto voxels show is closed, um, but there uh, are links to the other galleries that were part of the presentation. Would you mind putting those in the chat? So Not we at all, I'll do that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then we'll be doing a new uh, collaboration titled Prisms Indigo. Uh, and that will be in, oh, sorry, uh, in whose um, gallery, sorry? Yeah, so Prisms, uh, Prism Indigo will be at Chopper Chunky Gallery, um, it's, it's using Kuntz Matrix, and the artist and gallerist is Mark Craig, who is based in the UK. I have a question I'd like to ask both uh, Prince and ST about. First of all, I want to say that it's an incredibly phenomenal presentation of uh, the marriage of poetry and art. Um, I've been involved in exhibitions, analog exhibitions, but I've never quite seen anything the likes of this. So I'm really uh, enjoying what you've presented. Um, I have a question. 
There have been contributions to each piece by Prince, by ST, and then you mention other visitors who might be in the club room. My question is, who does what? Um, is it always that Prince does works with the poetry and ST, you're doing the uh, art or the illustration for it? Um, or do you, you know, does that get turned around? What comes first? Does the poetry come first? And then there's a reaction to the poetry and art or vice versa? I'd love to hear about that. Sure. So I'll just kind of lay stuff out and if I miss anything, STA, I know you got it. Um, but basically the way that we've looked at each collaboration on each project has been uh, conceptual in nature. So in the first one, we were playing with the idea of generative art, which in the NFT space is where they will take a single image like the board apes, the monkey image, and they just do slight variations of it. And it'll be a 10,000 image project where they use a generative AI and it comes up with 10,000 different slight variations, which they then sell. So we were kind of doing a critique of that by me pretending to be the generative AI using a single source photo of my dad's backyard and then turning it into a hundred actually unique individual images as opposed to do just slightly <laughs> different 10,000 images of an AI. Uh, so in that one, she was more of kind of, she with the performance aspect of it, the editing and the minting, she was kind of facilitating all of that in the room. Uh, since it's open for 12 hours, you're having to host, you're having to guide the narrative of the room, the conversations that people are having, making sure that people are in good moods, playing music at different times, especially with our projects. Uh, music is a big part of my language and hers. So we've, we've kind of woven that into those experiences to tell a third story uh almost a kind of soundtrack to the experience in a way um so that's been a lot of what she's done um on the first one and then on the second one echoes it was her art as the focus so she would do a drawing send it to me i would rework that drawing she would do a painting over that drawing i would then send that back to her she would create a composite image of those I would create the first poem, start of the poem. She would create the fin end of the poem. And that meant that as the final NFT. So that was a back and forth. Uh, and then on the last one, it was, so that one was playing with the idea of, uh, sorry, the process of AI, uh, the way that it actually works as far as an input output method. Um, where like with this GAN art, you're using some text and some uh, image in order to influence and create the output that it gives you as far as an image goes. So we were playing basically a kind of artistic kind of, I don't know, back and forth, some kind of ball game, <laughs> pretending to be this AI, I guess, in a way. Uh, in the way that we were processing the images and then compositing them together. Um, and then for the last one, I was kind of turning myself into a human GAN myself individually and opened myself up to the audience to be the input source, the source photo or the source inspiration from which then the image and the words or the poetry would come. Fascinating. I, what what iPhone app did you use? You mentioned using iPhone apps and doing it all on an iPhone. So yeah, for from, sorry, the, yeah, go ahead. For the, for the editing, um, I used for a surprising. I used an app called Instasize, um, and then for versions and no, sorry, for Echoes, I used Unfold. And then with versions, it was a mix of Instasize and Unfold. Um, go ahead, Prince. Thank you. No, sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Uh, yeah, because she actually had a lot more than me. I just used Instagram fil filters and that's it. 
I don't use any other editing software or anything at this point. Um, it's just exploring what it can do as an expressive tool. Uh, and that's been part of the journey. Wow. Instagram. Awesome. Well, I, yeah. I'm going to have to stop the questions here to allow uh, Michael um, some time to present. Um, definitely fascinating presentation, but I just want to make sure it's fair for all the presenters. Um, but I appreciate you guys coming on and, you know, you're definitely welcome to hang out after the presentation as well as anyone else here if there's further questions. Uh, since we did get a slightly late start, we'll stop the recording at um, 10 after 4. And um, I just wanted to thank you guys again for presenting and welcome, Michael. Thank you. Uh, wow, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, so I, I guess um, most of last year, or at least the first two thirds of the year, I was primarily focused on my solo show that was in September. And uh, part of, part of uh, the power of this community or this social sculpture uh, is in you all. And uh, so the, the fact that I can watch uh, Colin interview Victor uh, and learn about Victor's practice and his history. And then also to um, have private chats with some of you all like Renata and others to work um, with uh, talent like Lucy Boyd Wilson on my show last year to get invited to Ross's uh, presentation that she had and get to see some of her practice. It's, this is just such a wealth of uh, community, artistic talent and inspiration. And so from that standpoint, um, I wanted to switch gears a little bit today and to realize that you've seen sort of, um, the height of finished products, even though they were experimental in nature in some regards in terms of what was just shown, but then, but then also to see uh, all of Lily's beautiful work and how, she, how her artistic journey was there. I, I wanted to share my experimentation that I've been doing since my show last year in September. And some of it was inspired by uh, work that I've seen over uh, the last year in this salon and, uh, and from others. Um, so let me quickly share my screen here. Um, is this showing okay? Okay, awesome. Yep. So as probably some of you know, I do a lot of highly mathematically based uh, artwork, whether it's based on fractals or other mathematics. Um, and one of the things that's interested me has been creating mathematical sculptures. Um, and even though this, this one um, that I created here um, I wanted to show it kind of in a theoretical setting. So I created my own little museum corner. Uh, and then there's another piece here, the one in red, which is another uh, fractal based uh, piece of artwork. Um, and so I just, I just set this up. And like I said, these are, most of these are experimentations. I just kind of wanted to show a few of these. Um, this one's known as a hyperbolic uh, pseudosphere, which probably doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's a geometrical um, device. Um, and this, this is kind of some of the, the close up of it. Um, some of the other things that I've been playing around with um, is just how do I play with my own lighting 
my own techniques. And these are experiments that I've been playing around with. And I, I was hoping that um, I could get feedback from you all. And, and maybe this feedback will have to be after, after uh, hours here. Um, so I kind of wanted a bit of participation. Um, in, in this piece here, this is uh, like a 20 inch by 60 inch uh, piece that I created. And even though most of these have a, a very high mathematical uh, quality to them, I oftentimes go in and, and do digital painting techniques with that just to, just to mix things up and to add uh, my flair, my vision. Um, this is another one that's a very fractal looking uh, image. But what, I, what I've been playing around with are ways, techniques to add in kind of a 2D element in back to give uh, context and to add some more visual interest. This is the, an, another one uh, with the same kind of technique. Now this is interesting. So the next three images is the exact same mathematics, but looked at in different lighting, in different color techniques. And this is very much used um, in a lot of scientific realms and astronomy and such. When you see some of the beautiful uh, pictures of nebula and other things like that, you're actually looking outside of visual light range and the lights that you see are kind of manufactured so that we can see things visually because sometimes some of those are seen through x-rays, um, infrared and such. And so th this, is, this is the exact same, the exact same mathematics, but looked at um, and concentrated on with different lighting, different colors, and you can see very different sorts of images created. And so this is some of the experimentation that I've been working on this past, these past few months. And this one's very interesting. I call this one pushpin cloud. This has millions of like pushpin shapes that are scattered about fractally so that you get some interesting uh, light and dark shaded patterns. And once again, this is very much related to physics. Um, I don't want to get too nerdy, but at the Big Bang, when the universe started uh, expanding rapidly, the reason why we have galaxies and stars and planets is that there was a very, very slight clumpiness in the distribution of the energy and ultimately the matter that expanded. And that very, very, very slight clumpiness um, results in us and everything else that exists. And this is a similar technique that I used to create this grid looking system that I, I find very, very interesting. So I just wanted to show these very briefly because they're kind of the that they're kind of where a lot of my earlier art has come from. But then in the past year or so, I've been getting more and more interested and in working um, with AI. And this kind of dovetails a little bit from uh, what Prince and ST were, were talking about just in some of their explanations. So what I've done here is that I've taken some of my either existing artwork or uh, existing mathematical shapes and started using uh, various AI techniques. And primarily with this set that I just wanted to show you, um, these are what's known as style transfer. And this is a popular, very, very popular methodology that iPhones um, and, and smart devices will utilize to give you um, 
things that look like were created from Van, a Van Gogh style or something like that. Now, the thing, the thing that I'm most interested in is can I keep my own aesthetic and not just make it look like somebody else's? So this is part of my journey right now is how can I add a pinch of uh, this influence or this inspiration, but not make it look like it's, it's that other artist or something? Because I'm not interested in that. I, I want it to be about, uh, about what I do. So a lot, a lot of the style transfers, what I've done is our mashups of my own work with my own style, not bringing in another artist. And so these, these first few that I'm showing you are all various um, iterations of my own work, using my own work to create new work that's my own work. <laughs> and... Uh, so that's what these, these several are. And then I'm going to show you a couple others beyond that that have other influences. And, and again, these are all works in progress. I don't know that these are final yet. I, the challenge with, with the um, AI is that, and I think I've mentioned this before, is that the pixel counts are so small that for me as a print artist, um, I need, I've needed to create my own unique uh, upscaling techniques so that I can take something that's only like 512 by 512 pixels and bring it up to 6,000 by 6,000 pixels if I wanna print it 20 inches by 20 inches, which is a challenge. And you have to make interesting compromises uh, and such. So here's my first, here's my first experiment of mixing one of my previous fractal images, which the the more red and yellow area is primarily where the the fractal image was. I. It was my praying mantis fractal that I had created several years ago. So what I did was I mixed a bit of myself with a bit of um, Jean-Michel Basquiat and also with, um, with Pablo Picasso. And this is what, I, what I've come up with. Now, what I would be curious about and any reactions to um, would be, is it perfectly obvious that those are those influences or does it feel more like a, a well-blended mixture of things or, or does it feel completely foreign to me? Because that, that's why I would really appreciate feedback on that. Um, this is the same um, praying mantis fractal, but now um, I played around with influences of Hieronymus Bosch with Salvador Dali. And you can see a very different vibe, a very different result. I, I wanted to create something that felt very airy, and this feels more watery to me in some ways. So, but again, there's a lot of me in here, but there are some direct influences that I've tried to wrangle in. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to tell without some, without some feedback, kind of what you're all seeing. So, and then this is the, the last two here. Um, I, I created um, a number of very abstract black and white uh, mathematical fractal images and I worked in the influences of um, Ibrahim uh, El Salahi, who is a Sudanese uh, artist, who I love his work. It's uh, very, very, it's got a, a lot of the uh, influences of Islamic art in it, uh, as long, along with very uh, graphic, 
um, iconography involved as well. And I, I just have a real similar sensibilities of how I love that kind of artwork and his style and his story uh, really influenced me. So I just wanted to share these. And then the last, the last bit that I wanted to share um, is in the area of using, and, and again, this sounded like maybe um, our previous, the two previous artists may have used this. I don't know if uh, Prince Magnolia had, had alluded to this directly, but this is using uh, actual words to generate artwork uh, using uh, an available program or a set of programs, actually, a number of different styles that have happened using it, uh, BQ GAN plus CLIP. Um, and I find this very fascinating. The thing that to me is really interesting is that um, mathematics is ultra precise. Even if you're doing things using chaos theory, the math is still very precise. Language is completely imprecise. Um, it's filled with ambiguity. It's filled with um, past history. Um, the way in which we think we communicate clearly to other people, we get misinterpreted all the time. And so for me, part of the experimentation that I found very fascinating over the last several months has been working with this program to create uh, new types of both abstract art and bringing in a little bit of uh, other elements as well. And I'm just gonna kind of walk through these semi quickly just to, just to give you a flavor of what I've done. Um, this one, I just wanted to do kind of a chalk drawing that had kind of a misty feel about it. And, I, and I'm not gonna give you the exact words that I use for each of these. Um, but this one, I, I started off, and, and this process, you go through many iterations. It starts very broadly. You get the big brush strokes, if you will. And then as each iteration happens, it gets more and more tied into um, the imagery that has been inspired by the words that you, you know, threw in the input. And this one, I... I I did an experiment that said, I want to create a, a, a cityscape using Cyrillic alphabet. That, that was my input for this. And this is what it started off with. And this was the last iteration that I ended up with. So it went through many, many stages to go from this starting point to, to ending here. And again, these are small pixel sizes. I mean, this was like 600 by 800 or, or even maybe a little bit smaller than that. I don't remember now. Um, and part of my challenge again is in upscaling this work. And I've, a lot of these I haven't, I haven't played around with uh, upscaling yet. Again, a lot of this is very pure experimentation on my part. This was uh, a geometric landscape. So you can see some elements that look like look like maybe there are trees there, hills and things, but there's also geometric shapes involved in, in this as well. This is one I did um, for a, um, a still life with plants and text. And, and so this was very interesting. Here's another still life I did with flowers and fish. And you can see the, the fish emerging here down in this, down in this lower right-hand corner element. And you can, you can obviously see the flowers and such. This was one I did that I wanted to do, try out on a chalkboard put, putting uh, equations and text. This is one I wanted to do a sketch of black and white images and I just left it really, really open ended. I don't know why things look like faces. It looks like somebody was sketching portraits or something here. 
So I, again, this is just for me, a lot of just testing out. This one, I wanted to do a, a blue bison skull with um, a bright yellow uh, sunrise. This was a blue vase with sunflowers in the style of Jean-Michel Basquiat. I, I decided to try a few uh, cyberpunk, steampunk images. Um, this one I called the Court of the Steampunk Queen. <laughs> this was an interesting one. Um, I, I wanted to try doing a female nude wearing a gas mask. And this is, this is what emerged. And, and, and I said an abstract. So this is, this is what emerged from that. So um, black and white geometry, just to see what could come up here. A second black and white geometry, I, I varied it a little bit. This was a very interesting one. I typed in Guernica as a street fight. Um, and I, I don't know whether it focused on the artwork of Picasso. I don't know if it might have tried picking out uh, imagery from uh, you know the actual bombing and the destruction of Guernica, uh, but this was a very interesting uh, result. This this I typed in a great naval battle, an abstract great naval battle, and this this is I, I find this one kind of interesting. Um, this was a neural network in black and white. You can see a lot of sort of brain looking imagery as well. So it's kind of interesting. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is my steampunk Einstein, which I totally love. I think it's totally cool. <laughs> this is another uh, kind of portraiture. Um, I wanted to do something a little kind of uh, Da Vinci style. So I added some of that flavor in there. This is another one I totally dig. Um, I, I did um, a steampunk mad, mad scientist uh, that Egon Sheila would have painted. So uh, had a number of different interesting influences coming together, which again, for me, I, I'm just trying to test you know, kick the tires and test the engine with this thing just to see what's potentially possible. And to let you to let you know the difference, this image in the lower right hand corner here, this is the original. This this was five, I think 672 by 672 pixels. This is 6600 by 6600 pixels. So you can see the detail that I had to scale up and the challenge that's there. Um, and I used, I'm, I'm developing my own set of techniques, uh, partly using Gigapixel, which I highly recommend. It's a really, really good tool. Um, but I'm also working on other techniques that I'm developing on my own to help. The, the big challenge with upscaling from small to big is you have to make really artistic choices of at small scale, um, diagonals and shading and things oftentimes comes through as noise. And when you upscale noise, you just get a whole bunch of more noise. And as an artist, you have to decide, well, was that, was those, were those dotted lines really a solid line? Is it something else? And in the upscaling process, those decisions are really key and critical. Um, and Gigapixel, even though it's used primarily, I think, for photographers, um, I think as uh, people who might be interested in being able to create larger digital works from smaller AI works, um, I'm finding it a helpful tool uh, along the way. Uh, so anyway, 
Um, that's that's uh, kind of what I've been working on. And uh, it's, it's complete experimentation right now. I'm not sure exactly how, what of these images I've shown today I'm gonna use or if they're just uh, bits of learning along the way. So any feedback I uh, appreciate greatly. So uh, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Michael. Really appreciate you okay. presenting. And we have like about five minutes or so left. So okay. any questions so we could squeeze in. Um, and then after we stop the recording, we can certainly continue on and along those lines. Feel Michael, free to would, just shout out. I really want to compliment you, Michael, on the painterly quality, the visual painterly quality ah. of every one of those images. It's absolutely wonderful. I would Thank caution you. Though, you yeah, I would really caution you about uh, two things. Don't worry about whether anybody thinks that you stole something from uh, Dolly or Picasso. That that's ridiculous. Okay. Um, I, uh, you you come through good and strong. Okay. Don't worry about any of those influences whatsoever. Um, but I would like to see that you do. Uh, pick one uh, style that that attracts you the most, that expresses you the most, and do a complete series of at least ten images um, in that style. Okay, it will be very uh, interesting to see how they progress. In other words, if you if you type in "still life in cubism one" and said to the computer "still life cubism two," you and go along and see what happens um, because I suspect it's going to try to go back to the original images as much as it possibly can and you're going to have to really come up with some genius move to make it not do that. Okay, thanks Lee. Know that those are, I appreciate your feedback um, and it's really helpful. I mean, th this is what I value about all of you being such good artist is I appreciate your honesty and and you all have your own experiences where you're coming from and for me this this is what makes this group uh, something really really special to me so thanks is is there time for me to talk or do you want to wait till the recording stops Colin um go ahead There's time for one last question yeah, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Michael, first of all, I'm wowed by um, what you've shown us. Um, that Guernica as a street fight, what was your contribution to that? Was it the initial image um, or the language you put into the AI program? Good, that's a great question. Um, it There were two things. Part of it was the initial input in, into the to the AI, uh, so the language. Um, and then after what I showed there, I had played around with and manipulated to some degree. And um, oh. what, what changed was I changed some of the color palette um, I added in a few other elements without going back and kind of showing you the very first one and where it ended. Um, I, I would say that the imagery um, near the top and some of the bits in the middle um, were enhanced uh, and the colors were, were changed for the most part to get it to something that for me felt appropriate to the language that I had picked. But it surprised me. What I saw there really surprised me because I wasn't sure what I was going to get. I thought maybe originally I was going to get something that was a modification of Picasso's Guernica uh, image since it's so striking and it it's you know so well known 
but this the 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 street fight element i think influenced it and i don't and i so i can't say what elements of guernica whether it was because there were a lot of photographs of the town uh, after the bombing you know and the devastation there that you can find online as well so i you know it's hard for me to know um where where the imagery was drawn there thank you Um, what's the name of the software that you used, Michael? Uh, for the very last. For when you type in your search test. variables, yes. Yeah. But, uh, I am typing it into chat. Okay. Thanks. It is called BQGAN. Oops, plus clip. It's uh, it's an open source available. It's available. I mean, if you type BQGAN plus clip, you will find many, many uh, references to it. Um, some people are have created paid sites where you. The, the thing is you're accessing a database and you're accessing um, the AI uh, through publicly available or, or university setting uh, computer programs and um, or computers. And so if your time is limited and the easiest way to limit the time um, is for the image sizes to be rather limited. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't see where, on you, where you want to go with it, um, you're, you're looking at, like I said, most times you're limited to pixel sizes that are several hundred pixels in one dimension versus another, you know, the other dimension. So they're, they're mm -hmm. fairly limited in size, but very yeah. interesting. Yeah, I don't see where, oh, did Carlin post the link? Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. I posted go. something for medium, but the search term would be would be this um, VQGAN okay. plus CLIP. Yeah. Um, okay. That would, that would be the the search term, and then you could find you know a bunch of different resources online about that particular um, GAN, I believe. So yeah. um, we're just about out of time though for the recording and we you know, left, definitely be sticking around for whoever wants to stay. But I just like to once again, thank um, our presenters for today, Lily and um, Prince, ST, Michael, um, very um, diverse and interesting salon as always. I feel like it really ranged the gamut from traditional to present day to future tense um, and you know all different types of media and ideas really really interesting and diverse um, presentations but they all somehow you know interconnected in a variety of ways too so I think that's that's what makes this um, group so special um, and I am going to um, stop the recording in five four three two one